All right, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about scaling machine learning microservices. Um, it's uh, called a bag of tricks for if your stuff starts breaking, or most likely when uh, your stuff starts breaking, if it's like mine. Ciao a tutti, sono Duarte. Uh, so the pronunciation you, you did was great. It's like do art. It's like a Portuguese weird name. Uh, I'm a machine learning uh, slash software engineer uh, and contractor. Uh, I'm originally from Portugal, Lisbon, which is very hype right now. Uh, I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I've been there for about seven years. But I spend my summers in the uh, Lamarca region uh, here in Italy, uh, mostly running around the hills there. That's where my girlfriend's from. And that's one of my favorite places on earth. So I really love coming back to Italy. Um, in the past, I worked in strategy, product management, management consulting, new ventures, so I kind of did the rounds. Uh, now, uh, the thing that I do mainly is just solving tough problems end-to-end, -to -end. even if that concerns machine learning, software, I don't really care that much, as long as it's a tough, challenging problem that is really hard to solve. And this is a picture of me when I had all of my engineering credibility, big beard, and uh, yeah, looking like a badass now. <laughs> I look like, uh, yeah, not an engineer anymore. And yeah, I just wanted to take like a quick step back and like, it's such a cool conference, Spike in Italy. Like, just for, I went for a run this morning. I run like, uh, yeah, a couple of marathons a year. I really enjoy it. And uh, the views around Florence are just so incredible that sometimes we're like here at PyCon and we're like really thinking about work and stuff. But I mean, it's the most beautiful conference that I've been. So, so it's my second year. I, I will always come back whenever I can. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about, let's start about talking about my machine learning microservices. And I'll start with a little short story of a prototype. I had this client and OpenAI and GPT and all that stuff was coming out and everyone was super excited. They were like, okay, Duarte, we need to build a system that creates super personalized emails. Uh, we have two weeks. Good luck. I was like, okay, okay, cool. Here I go. And I still remember I was at my parents' place in Lisbon um, and it was like uh, four days into the project. And uh, I spent like three hours from 8 p.m. to like 11 coding this thing away, like building, uh, using OpenAI's API, doing Jinja templates for building all the prompts and with the conditional. So I was going crazy for like three hours. And um, the crazy thing is that it was called, it was like an MVP scenario, right? You build something in two weeks, you see where it takes. And of course, that ended up in production with uh, like uh, lots of users, like thousands of users a, a day. And uh, unfortunately, 90% of the code of the set that was in production, I had written in like, me and my team had written like in a, yeah, in like three hours. And so today, we'll, we'll talk about designing prototypes that scale well, uh, mostly by leveraging Python, uh, the language we all love and use, uh, and how really can we leverage it to build something that works from the start and that scales from the start. And so we'll talk about three things mainly. Uh, the first one is about productionizing. If that's a word, I'm not sure, but let's pretend it is. Uh, the second one is about deploying. And the third chapter is about serving those applications. And so let's start with productionizing. This is a classic, right? I mean, Python is slow. Uh, everyone's talking about Rust in, in, in this conference uh, this week. And uh, Python, always people say that why are you not losing a language that is much faster than Python? Python is the bottleneck of the stuff you're doing. And the fact is that, yeah, of course, you could write stuff in multiple other languages. But the problem is not necessarily always the language. The problem is how you're kind of designing it. And there are at least three ways to speed up your Python code for scale. Um, and some of these are basic for you, I'm sure, if you're really advanced. But it's, I think it's important for us to keep in mind those ways. And, and the first one of them is concurrency. And so let's take a normal example, right? Like this is a typical predict endpoint using fast API. I know there's one of the maintainers out there, so I hope this is not too bad. Uh, you take some items, you, you, you loop onto those items, you fetch some data about those items, probably from an external API. You gather those features, you, you predict with your model, you return uh, your model's predictions. Typical use case, right? Um, the thing is that it's, if it's I.O. bound, it's not very fast. And so, I always tend to come back to this classical uh, tree, like this cheat sheet, if you can call it, from superfastpython.com, great website. And, and I always think, OK, like I have, I'm doing a lot of looping. Am I doing something that is CPU bound, compute intensive? Am I doing something that is I.O. bound? Am I like fetching from an API, fetching from a database? How can I make this code parallel and concurrent and much faster? And so I always go back and say, OK, 
Am I do touching from an API? Here I go. Many ad hoc tasks. No, thousands of sockets. That's what I want. Let's go with async IO. Um, that's normally how I think. And so this is kind of a faster example uh, of like we're doing the same. We're fetching the items. Instead, we're using this thread pool executor to fetch all of the IO data in parallel. Um, horrible to read, right? Not very Pythonic, but uh, significantly faster. So use this with care, but keep those in mind because uh, for your APIs, you can really speed things up. And this is a way of using this for the, with the power of evil. I had this guy try to scam me uh, when I was selling my bet online. Uh, he tried to get my credit card number. So I basically used thread pool execution to send him a bunch of fake credit card numbers. It was really fun. I, uh, with the power of concurrency, I really think I screwed up his database. So it was a great time. So it shows that you can use this for, for good things as well. OK, the th second way of speeding up uh, our Python code, and, and it's called caching. Most of you, I'm sure, if you're advanced, you know about caching, right? This, we import from func tools, standard library, the last recently used cache. Here we have a Fibonacci function. It's basically like making, putting a dictionary on top of your function. So that if we compute that score before, then we just fetch from the dictionary instead of computing again. And that can result in a massive increase of speed. Uh, yeah, in this case, yeah, a million times, three million times. It's, it's a bit crazy. And so caching ensures that we don't need to do double work when double work is not needed. If we've computed before, why compute it again? And so especially when you're doing external API calls, DB lookups, or you're making predictions from your model, this is a great thing to keep in mind. Normally, you have kind of two ways to go about this. I'm sure you have thousands of ways, but I only know mainly two. The LRU cached, which is keeps track of the most recently computed things and if we should use them or not. And the uh, one that is really cool that I actually started using is, is the time to leave cache. So imagine your function predicts the weather. Weather probably changes every day, right? So you don't want to keep the cache just the weather of today. Probably that weather changes quite fast, so you want to use the time to leave cache. So maybe you want to cache a value for 10 minutes. Especially if you're operating on a database that changes fast, TTL cache is a, is a great way to solve those problems that I've had and people complaining to me that things are getting stuck in production. All right, queuing. Third uh, way to speed up your Python code. And it's not really speeding up. <laughs> and the point here is that if you cannot make it fast, then at least make it appear fast. <laughs> and, and the point here is that things take time, OK? Um, and, but there's waiting time. And there's perceived time. Uh, you know when you're waiting for something and there's a little cartoon on the screen. And you're like, OK, there's a little cartoon, so I'll wait a bit more <laughs> instead of just wait, looking at a blank screen. And so there's at least two ways that I really like to speed up my, my, my APIs and my microservices. First one is fast API background jobs. And the second one is Redis queuing. And so here in this example, I'm inferring on a bunch of strings. I will authenticate the user, and I see if the user has requested if he wants me to queue this stuff up. If he wants to queue me up, then I'll, I'll, I'll create a job. I'll already queue this run model with the parameters. Then I'll use FastAPI's background jobs that on the back always check when that job is finished. Once that job is finished, then we use the job completion notifier to notify my user. And, but this happens in the back, so we instantly return a job ID. But if the user doesn't want to, 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 to like just have that, then we can wait still and not enqueue it. And finally, these are two great resources that I really advise you to read if you're, if you're like me and write, like reading this stuff on your spare time. I, I hope you don't. Um, these are two great books about scaling Python, one from Julian Danjou, the other one from Brett Stockin, uh, about how to make your stuff really fast. So you don't switch to Rust. No, I'm kidding. Rust is amazing. Uh, deploying. Second thing. So there are mainly four ideas to, I, I mainly keep four ideas in mind when, when I'm deploying cloud applications. And the guy before me, Andrea, really talked about this. And I think our talks are complementary. He's mostly right. I am mostly wrong. <laughs> and so yeah, four ideas that I keep in mind. First one, make it work for you. Really leverage the cloud. Like These things are powerful. So really use them to your, to, to your point. Second point, can you actually lift your stuff? If you need to move from GCP to AWS, and I've seen this happen in a lot like large clients, can you actually lift your stuff? Third, open source first. These guys love for you to write proprietary Lambda functions. Okay? They love for you to write exactly pip install Google Cloud or AWS so that you never leave it. Uh, and fourth, watch the spending. These things are expensive. So uh, if you choose Lambda, know that if you're scaling up, it's going to cost some money. All right. But today we'll only talk about two, by the way, because yeah, this, I don't have a lot of time. 
So first one, make it work for you. Classic, right? I'll just deploy to the cloud. Great. Then you have thousands of services on Google Cloud, thousands of things to choose from, from migrations to whatever, like so many services, right? So the, I'll just deploy to the cloud doesn't really convince me. How exactly are you going to put this stuff out there is much more interesting. And so Andrea talked about uh, IaaS, PaaS, and I think he said uh, that someone said that PaaS was always better. Uh, I also, I, I don't agree. These are three types of services, right? IaaS, which is basically, here's a VM, SSH into it. PaaS, which is basically, hey, here's my container, run it. And then FAST, which is, here's my Python code, zip it up, run it. Uh, and so uh, this exists across GCP, Azure, um, Azure, GCP, and AWS, they're kind of all the same. This website just compares their services across. Um, so these are all the same in, in the three big guys, right? Uh, you have different levels of control, right? So you have uh, a lot of control. If you're running your server, you can really know what's going on, and that's great, but you have to update those app get packages, and that's a pain in the ass. And so you can also go in the fast, and you just give it the code, which is great, just the code, right? But then it has uh, some it needs to start up times, and you're not really sure what's running on the back, and it's not that powerful. So the point here is that it's a trade-off. But normally, I like to make it work for me. And so I normally start with things that are really, really easy, like functions. I just sit on a function, use the simplest thing possible. Then I normally start having some memory issues, and then I start going for paths. And I'm like, here's my container. Let me control how many containers. And that normally, sometimes, I hope not, I need to deal with GPUs. I really hate them. I have traumas about them. And then sometimes I end up going for EAS and I have to manage my own machine, which is a pain. My sweet spot is definitely uh, pass, right? But I, n I never start there. I always start like super easy. I'm very lazy. The least stuff I have to do, the better. Second point about um, uh, this is deploying. So can you lift it? And here we'll talk about Docker. And Docker is like the de facto industry choice for a lot of this stuff, right? Like it's super easy to use. It's flexible with all the images. You have extensive tooling to use like whatever you want in Docker, do whatever with CUDA, no problems. Uh, it solves all of your dependency hells, but even the talk before Andrea was saying that poetry sucked, so I guess Docker doesn't solve all your problems. And it can also quickly become the source of nightmares, right? Like, here's my bin file. That's what most data scientists say. Like, here's my torch model. Just go and run it. Uh, you end up with gigantic Docker images. Even yesterday, I was, my server went down. And I noticed that, yeah, I had 140 gigabytes of yeah, hanging on containers. And that's why my server was blowing up. That's what I was doing yesterday at midnight, <laughs> basically rebooting all of my images. And you get these long and, and expensive build times, right, where uh, we've seen this use case where your data scientist or machine learning engineer putting an API out there, and your GitHub actions take seven minutes or 15 minutes. And the longer that stuff takes, the less you are likely to put code into the production fast. And so it solves things, but, but not really. But my point is that there are some principles that I always keep in mind to like, build these Docker images that really help me in the back. Um, and I want to share those with you if, in case you find them interesting. First one, choose the right image. Right? The base image is really important to choose from. Uh, if you go with Slim Buster, or you go with Ubuntu, or we go with Debian, you better know what you're putting on that dependency, because that's going to determine the most of, amount of how big your image is. Second one. Only copy what you absolutely need, please. Do not copy your PyCache files. Use a Docker ignore, for example, and only copy the things you absolutely need to copy. Third point, combine commands for smaller images. If you combine your commands, it, it possibly will slower your build, will be a bit slower, but your image will be much smaller. So whenever you can combine these commands, do that. And then like a golden rule that I read on the blog, and it's probably wrong, but I think it's nice, is like order the things from the least to the most frequently changing. So things that don't change a lot go up top. Things that change a lot go towards down. Uh, and these are yeah, some principles that, that I like to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, now, this one is also good uh, about Docker. If you build an image and you don't know like, exactly what's going on in that image and why the hell is it six gigabytes, use this tool called Dive. 
and you can do dive and then container name and it will tell you exactly like what's picking up space on your container. So it's a really good way of knowing what's going on. Um, and then finally, like these also two great resources I use whenever I'm like using Docker. The first one is a talk by Matthias Browns uh, in NormConf called How Small Can We Get That Container? It's a bit of a parody where he kind of tries to put a container that's from two gigabytes to like 25 megs. I do not advise you to do that, but it really talks you like how can you like really control what's going on with your Docker container. And then um, another great resource is, I mean, these like, these, it's one of those like pinnacle Python websites that I love. It's called pythonspeed.com by Itamar Trollring. Whenever I'm doing anything with Docker and Python, I'll go to pythonspeed.com. He has the most extensive amount of resources, how you should package up your data science code, what to do, what not to do. So these guys are much better than me at telling you what you should do uh, or at giving you some advice. So whenever you're facing these issues, go in and, and take a look at these guys. These, they're, they're, they're really doing some great job. Cool. We talked about uh, productionizing. We talked about deploying. Now let's talk about serving. Not tennis serving, uh, serving your actual app. Cool. First thing, NumPy is freaking fast. Use it, okay? A lot of us, at least me, we, uh, we build these machine learning models, or we build these pipelines, we build these APIs. We use Pandas, we use NumPy, they're all great. Those, like, they're, they're, they're the first pip installs, right? But then it comes and we're serving stuff, and we're serving our API, and we completely forget about them. Here's a typical example, right? We have, again, our predict endpoint. We validate the data. If the data is not valid, then we say, your data is not valid. We clean up the data. We, we predict on that item. We, we format the data of that, those predictions to make sure they look nice and dandy. And then we return the output. Classic, classic, classic. Here's a much faster uh, option, where I'm doing, first of all, a batch predict. I'm not doing one item, I'm doing all, as many items as you want, okay? I'm removing those duplicates of those items because you are probably lazy consuming my API, so you always send me a bunch of duplicate stuff. And so I'm removing all that duplicate stuff. I'm also leveraging list comprehensions from Python just because I like them, okay? And then whenever I'm doing this clean data function where I'm processing multiple elements, I'm probably using NumPy or Pandas on the back here. So I'm leveraging all the power of C on the back to make those cleaning and that formatting as fast as possible. And then, have you guys ever wondered like why the dot predict endpoint or endpoint, no, like um, basically API or, or function or method, in all of these models always supports, always gets a vector and not a single item? It's because these APIs were designed to predict on multiple stuff. Even if you're doing like a hugging face torch model or you're doing a scikit model, you are, like these things are made to predict batches. And so the first thing that you, oh, I always do, uh, whenever I create my APIs is I create a batch predict endpoint. I do not predict on single instances. I always predict for multiple items, okay? And I leverage, leverage all the things that Python gives to me, okay? So all the NumPy and all the pandas, it really makes a difference. Cool. Now the second to last point um, about um, serving. Can we handle the load? And when you're thinking about scaling machine learning microservices or microservices in general, we always have this question of like, okay, can we actually handle thousands of users? And eventually you build up your MVP, 90% uh, of that was not ready to go to production, but here you go building that stuff up and then you get two weeks pass on, three weeks pass on and you start getting a lot of users and eventually Starts, things start slowing down and, and, and things start going wrong, okay? And when things start slowing down and going wrong, that's when <laughs> what happens that I say is like the, the farts in the wind start happening. <laughs> what I mean by the farts in the wind is like, no guys, like we need, we need more Docker containers. No, it's Docker, like Docker is not giving us what we need. Or no, no, you need to add RAM to your app, like more RAM, more RAM, push it up. Or like, no, no, it's because we're sync and you should be async or you're async and you should be sync and, and everyone gets confused. What the hell should you be doing? And so everyone has kind of doing, is like throwing farts in the wind. Opinions about what is going wrong and 
how we should do better and things like that. And I don't really, I, I really hate that approach. <laughs> I, I much prefer where if we back things up with, hey, this is happening because this is happening. And I tested it out and this is why this is happening. And I much prefer like a scientific approach to solving problems. And when I'm facing with this challenge of like, is this shit, it's, oh sorry, is this stuff scaling like it should? I use a little tool called Locust. Uh, has anyone here heard about Locust? Okay, there's a lot of advanced guys. Cool, nice. <laughs> cool. Locust is a, it's a great tool. So uh, check this out. Whatever you, what you first do is you define your Locust file, okay? And this is basically a, a rule set of, okay, run this test, which is you're gonna post to my basic endpoint, you're gonna send some headers, and here's my JSON with my three favorite cities that I'm gonna post to my endpoints, to my machine learning app to make a prediction, okay? Then you go and you open the Locust file, and the lo you just run Locust and you say, okay, I want to simulate 10,000 users and you want you to span 100 users per second and this is the endpoint of my local running app. And so what Locust will do is it will literally hammer your API. It will send you 10,000 users. It will, it, say, it will replicate exactly what will go on if your app scales to thousands of users. And so there will be a point where you'll be like, okay, what's my average response time? And it will tell you for all of the endpoints what is your like, average millisecond response time, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is the 95th percentile of your response time and how those worst, those worst predictions are going on. That's what really matters. And you'll also see this curve of, okay, how long are taking all of my requests? When are things starting to slow down? When are things starting to choke up? And this allows you to know exactly what is going wrong and when it's going wrong and what is your, in your app is choking up. A lot of the times for me, or, and this, this slide of course comes from trauma. It's <laughs> something that happened to me in production. And so what was happening in production is that I was uh, like uh, mixing asyncs with syncs and stuff like that. And I had a Google BigQuery uh, function running on the back which was choking everything up. And so yeah, uh, Locust really helped me uh, figure out what's going wrong. And hopefully if you don't really know if it's gonna scale, use it. I mean nothing like really seeing if it scales or not in your own machine. And so, yeah. Cool, we have uh, three minutes left, so what's the, what's, what's the big deal, Dor? Okay, that's really nice. Um, BCG, they always said in the slide, so what? What's the point? A and the point is three points. First of all, make sure your prototype is battle ready. People love telling you like, yeah, build an MVP in two weeks and then we'll see, we'll rebuild it from scratch. That never happens. So make sure your prototype is battle ready. Squeeze the performance juice from Python. Learn concurrency and multi-threading, and try not to block your user. Give that illusion of speed. My second point is faster deployments means faster development. So first of all, choose the right cloud service for your needs. Know how to improve your containers and make them fast and make them small. And faster builds means more deployments. If things take 10 minutes to reach production, you're gonna push to production less often. That's basically the point. And then third point is, when does our app blow up? <laughs> so leverage NumPy and Pandas, get a batch endpoint running early, and pressure test your APIs so that you exactly know when things will blow up before they do. And yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a whole lot of questions, and we have like six minutes. Oh, no. So <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go to the moment. <laughs> yes, one yes. Enough. Yeah. So um, the first one, how would you cache data like images and text? Well, uh, text, I think, is uh, the, the easier one. Um, easier, not easier, but of course you can use just the raw text and make like caching of whatever text got thrown into your API. Another possibly a little bit more uh, efficient way would be kind of hashing that text uh, or doing some sort of table lookups to that text or even some sort of like simple embeddings of, of those texts. But normally like first thing, just throw the text. Are we talking about big paragraphs? Because if we're not, use the text. And for images, uh, yeah, images, it's, it's a bit harder. Images, it's kind of big, so uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't have a good answer. I would have to look it up like exactly how I would do it. Okay. But good question, good question. Great. Second, are you aware of any way of load testing the ML microservice before deployment so you can get a taste of the performance beforehand? 
Yeah, this locust. Uh, you, you actually uh, can run this locally. I, I'm sure. If, uh, I'm sorry if I didn't give you the, the if that wasn't clear. But uh, you run locust locally. You you spin up your API locally in localhost, and then you say to locust, "Hey, hammer down my localhost." And then you'll see on your localhost how things are running. And the idea here is that it will give you a good idea how these things are running in prod. Great. Do you also use two-stage Docker builds and caching? Uh, yeah, I think multi-stage Docker builds are, are a great thing. Um, especially I, in Python, I, I haven't really leveraged them for it. And, and if you guys don't know, it's like this way of making like a, a, an image or a base image to build your app and then another image to serve your app. Uh, and that's a really good way of like also minimizing the size of your images. Um, and so yeah, de definitely uh, I've used it before and I definitely recommend you to check it out. And that website that I recommended has much more knowledge than me about that stuff. So, so definitely go there. Great. What is your DevOps MLOps strategy tool set? <laughs> My MLOps strategy is keep it stupid simple, <laughs> okay? Keep it as simple as possible and only increase complexity when you need to. Uh, I, I also gave a talk about MLOps, a poor man's guide to MLOps, uh, which is for me, um, MLOps is also about focusing on the software and those software practices and also DevOps. Of course, uh, a lot of times I don't deal with like machine learning platform teams. Uh, I don't deal with that scale. Normally, in, in most of my clients, which are scale-ups, it's like, we need to build this fast. We do not have a lot of time to build platforms. So go ahead and show some value. Uh, and so yeah, my strategy is keep it simple, think, make it work, and, and then we'll talk about making things complex. In your deployment, how do you address all the vulnerabilities that are usually found by security container scanners? By, by doing what, sorry? In your deployment, yeah. how do you address all the vulnerabilities that are usually found by security container scanners? Ah, you see, like when you build that Docker image, there's a little sync. We find some vulnerabilities in your image type of thing. Yeah, I, I don't really address that that often. To be okay. but, <laughs> I, but, I, but, I, but I'm sure it's very important and I'm doing a lot of things wrong, but uh, I tend to ignore it and mm. clearly I should not. Okay. I like your slides. How do you make the slides? Uh, by hand, <laughs> so you take PowerPoint <laughs> and then you, you write them. That's basically uh, what I do. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like I mean, I did. I did. I, 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 I've used. Uh, I, I've used like PowerPoint generators and like you know like write that stuff in JavaScript. And just do, you know generate your slides. It normally doesn't really work for me. And uh, whenever I the school where I learned how to build slides was was BCG and. I didn't really, didn't really mess around with like uh, automation of slides. That's th something you need to think about every slide. Okay. Okay. I hope you like them. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> they are great. Love <laughs> okay. What are your views on making models smaller using things like quant quantization and ONNX? Yeah, uh, I, I haven't used ONX. Uh, for me, it's, I don't know, it's always a pain, <laughs> right? Uh, for m big models are coming and they're really tough to, to handle. What I normally do is that I build my Docker image, I keep the, 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 the model out, and then I'll pull the model in when it's runtime. And I'll try that model not to build and, and, and completely bust my container. But definitely, it, it, it's, it's becoming very big, and, and so it's tough. But hopefully, we'll start using also OpenAI and stuff like that, so I, I won't need to worry so much about pulling that, those big models in. Okay. Thoughts on code quality for battle-ready MVP? Yeah. Um, use uh, this. I do the, when I have teams of guys that are a little bit junior than me. Uh, not that I'm very experienced. I'm clearly not. <laughs> um, I normally tend to use like uh, GitHub Actions a lot. So what I would do is that I, I we have some rules, right? Some opinions about black and, and rough and stuff like that. So I don't really do like Git commits. What I do is that I get a, a GitHub action and some unit tests. And whenever junior guys or or, or, or everyone, even me, makes the PR. If rough doesn't pass, if black doesn't pass, if the unit test doesn't pass, there's a big X on that PR. And I'm saying, OK, uh, we need to, to, to do something here. Uh, what I also do is that I, I, I set a limit for cut cover, code coverage and, 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 and tests. And so if anything is below 75%, the PR it has just a big cross. And we don't need to have discussions about oh, tabs and spaces and whatever code styles. It just enforces that stuff on CI. And then if there's a big cross, we need to take that big cross out before we merge it. And, and that's how I, I tend to do it. Thank you. Last question, quick one. How do you deal when your clients need to have a single prediction and you want to do a batch prediction? Uh, you do a batch prediction and you always index the first. Exactly the same. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you, that's all. Thank you all for joining and thank you.